uh, I had the King of the Mountain match right. in, uh, in TNA. And I was writing about it for Countdown to Lockdown. And on that one night, I got my bell rung three times. You know, saw stars, temporarily blacked out. 14, 15 year old me was a massive WWE wrestling fan, unashamedly so. But recently, I came across a clip on YouTube from the podcast by Mick Foley, the hardcore legend who was a big part of wrestling like in the 90s and the early 2000s. But he's been speaking very candidly about the long-term consequences of all the repeated head injuries and concussions he suffered and how this is affecting him now, so 20 years down the line. A lot of what he said is really, really interesting, and I think we can learn a lot from this because this is an issue that's coming up not just in wrestling, but also in boxing, uh, in NFL, in America, and in rugby and actual football in the UK as well. It gives us a chance to think about what concussions actually are and some of the evidence base behind the relationship between repeated concussions and potential neurodegenerative illnesses in later life, one condition being chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Ready? Let's crack on. I was pretty happy, but the downside is I was really feeling the effects from the concussions. You know, I was really struggling with the, uh, the depression that comes along with that. When it comes to traumatic brain injuries, we class them as mild, moderate, or severe based on the person's Glasgow coma scale. Now, if you're a med student watching this or a nurse or a paramedic, then you're probably better than me at actually remembering how to calculate someone's GCS. It's been a while now. A concussion technically is a type of mild traumatic brain injury i.e. there's no acute problem seen on a CT scan of your brain, for example, like bleeding into your brain. Your GCS doesn't drop below 13, and any loss of consciousness is relatively brief in the grand scheme of what brain injuries can actually look like. But don't let the word mild be misleading. While more often than not, one concussion will lead to a full recovery, particularly if you rest. If you don't, one concussion can quickly spiral into another, into another, into another. And if this is from your line of work, one concussion can quickly spiral into the hundreds. That's where things get really dangerous. Um, I think I even said on my a &E biography, they didn't, they didn't go to details, but they took the sound bite, is that I would wake up certain mornings and I'd just go, oh, this doesn't even have the chance of being a good day. And the morning is so often the worst time for people that do have depression. We call it a diurnal variation in mood, where often it's that first bit of the morning that you wake up and you go, What's the point? Concussions can lead to a range of cognitive symptoms, confusion, problems with short-term memory, dizziness, poor coordination, but also then difficulties in regulating our impulses and regulating our emotions. People can feel quite apathetic, but then be quick to feeling fear and feeling anger. Emotions can just change like that. We also know that many mental illnesses are overrepresented in people that have had an acquired brain injury. Whether this is depression, whether this is anxiety disorders like generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder. And because of difficulties with impulse control, it probably makes sense that we see then higher rates of things like substance use disorders. There's a likely neurological component to it, so the structural damage to parts of the brain that regulate our impulses, like the prefrontal cortex, but also the psychological effects of adjusting to living with these symptoms symptoms and the knock-on effect and often disabling effect that this can have on multiple facets of your life. Because of the way I felt and there's that fog that follows you. A lot of people have had the concussions. Mm -hmm. You feel like you're in a fog or you're underwater but there's a muted feeling and you're walking around like Without all, with your senses are greatly dulled by these I think a lot of people with depression can probably relate to that because too. Because I was essentially getting one every time I got in the ring. Wow. And this is the issue, right? So if you have one concussion, you need to rest until you're fully recovered to reduce your chances of getting another one. Symptoms of a concussion include an impairment in something we call executive function. This is a very mature brain function. It involves planned, socially acceptable, thought through ways of achieving our goals. And it requires attention, judgment, working memory, all stemming from this structure in the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Psychiatrist's favorite part of the brain because the prefrontal the cortex is basically implicated in every neuropsychiatric disease that we, we study and that we treat. If you combine difficulties with attention, judgment, working memory, slower reaction times, poor coordination, and it's no wonder that if you don't fully recover from one concussion and you're still symptomatic when you go out and do something like wrestling or another sport that might involve the risk of a head injury, you're much more likely to sustain another, another one and another and another and another and another. One concussion can breed more concussions if you do not allow yourself to recover. And I did kind of realize it because I remember there were times 
uh, like after Rick and I had had that a really good match where I was like, okay, I can tell by like the adrenaline rush, but the ringing, there was this strange feeling where the combination of uh, euphoria, adrenaline, in a way that you know from past history is going to manifest itself in a big downer within yes. a day or two's time. And that must be really scary to experience, that you're on this sort of high, but knowing that there's going to be a low that's going to come, but you're not quite sure when and where and how and in what way. And our prefrontal cortex regulates our more impulsive parts of our brain. You start acting more impulsively, but it also becomes much more difficult to regulate your emotions. It's more difficult to regulate reward pathways or the fear response in the amygdala, etc. So then these emotions just hit you like a ton of bricks. And then they can completely switch and be turned on their head. Uh, I had the King of the Mountain match right. in uh, in TNA and I was writing about it for countdown to lockdown and on that one night I got my bell rung three times you know saw stars temporarily blacked out and every other That's time something like night. that has happened during the course one of my is career, too many. I could watch the match back and go, oh, oh where it happened. that's where it happened. The last time we show, showcased when Booker's uh, super kick. You could tell. Yeah, you could tell. Boom. And then, okay, that's why I felt that way the next couple of days. But in this case, I'd be like, okay, here come those forearms from Samoa Joe, which look like regular forearms. So concussions are happening comes this from kick. impacts that are of lesser and lesser regular. severity. Here comes this thing. And I kept saying, maybe they're missing the camera angles. Concussions are not just from direct impacts to the head. Anything that makes this soft, mushy brain bounce around inside our rock hard skull can increase, I'm using, all the, I'm using all the technical medical terms here, can lead to a concussion. Most head injuries, including concussions, will happen from an acceleration, deceleration injury. There's an impact that happens, your head moves forward and then back, and it's the sudden start and then the sudden stop that makes the soft mushy brain inside our skull bounce back and forth. And the problem is that brain then bounces off the hard surfaces on the inside of our skull. So it's not just the parts of the brain where the initial impact is, it's the other parts of the brain that bash against the skull as it's bouncing around. The frontal lobe and the temporal lobes are really vulnerable to this because it's these parts of the skull that have the sharpest, spikiest bits on the inside. The frontal lobe has the prefrontal cortex, the temporal lobe has a big role in the fear response from the amygdala, our emotion regulation, short-term memory with the hippocampus, so we can start to match up the structures that are really vulnerable to damage in the brain with the symptoms people commonly experience as a result of a concussion or any other type of traumatic brain injury. Uh, a year or so later, or may have been two years, when I got off the stage in uh, in Boston with Chris Nowinski in the audience, I said, Chris, I said, this might sound crazy, but I feel like I'm getting better. And he said, Mick, what you're doing on that stage is like gymnastics for the mind. Hmm. It's the best form of exercise. I said, how so? He goes, well, you have stories that you've memorized. You have stories that you're So this is all about on, the theoretical basis of brain training, right? So he called it mental gymnastics. And even though uh, this run of the tour is over and I'm not sure when I'll be going out on a regular basis again, I've got other things that keep my mind working like this show. Neurons in our brain have one life. They're not like skin cells that continue dividing and then we shed the old ones. We have a whole new set. Same in the gut. Neurons? Nah, 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 nah. When a neuron dies, that's a net loss of neurons in the brain. There isn't a new one that comes in nicely and replaces it. However, even though they don't divide into new ones, they're incredible at growing and adapting their connections and strengthening their connections where needed based on learning and experience. This is the theoretical basis for brain training, which is already a multi-million dollar industry. However, the evidence is quite conflicting as to whether it really works to slow the progression of neurodegenerative illnesses like dementia, or at least to try and improve key functions of the brain, like executive function and memory in the context of somebody going through a progressive brain disease. Part of that is because the studies themselves are not the best. Again, it's quite a difficult group to study. For many people though, I think there is very little downside in trying it. For those people that have more advanced dementia, pushing this on them. So particularly maybe family members that have the best of intentions who are really trying to slow this progression, say, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. Um, it can actually be extraordinarily stressful and overwhelming with very little benefit. But the exercises themselves actually have next to no harm. Um, I suppose it's the faith that people put in them that can be harmful if the expectations aren't right and even if the intentions are good. I'm not saying that every condition uh, can be uh, cured or greatly improved, but brother, don't, you don't give up. Don't try. give up. 
You don't know unless you try, and uh, above all else, a positive mental outlook is more important than anything. Yes, but easier said than done. We know that nearly all chronic medical conditions are associated with higher rates of depression and that untreated depression can then worsen outcomes. So whether this is people uh, with heart failure or COPD or things like dementia with then depression on top. You isolate yourself so you reduce your support network around you that's there to try and help you. It can make people more apathetic to then engage in the different types of treatments that are needed, not just medications, but the non-medication stuff that is so important in loads of different chronic health conditions. Uh, you lose structure to your day and a healthy bit of distraction that can be really good and give you a sense of relief, all fueled by this sense of perpetual hopelessness that is uh, itself a symptom of depression. So a plea to my fellow healthcare professionals, if you are helping to support people with chronic disease, please keep an eye out for potential comorbid depression. That's a very treatable condition and massively will improve people's quality of life and their outcomes from the original disorder that you're trying to treat. Impact Test is meant to give you a baseline mm. that can be judged against after a head injury. So your baseline is supposed to be you at your best, and then they will compare that to where you registered. You're comparing after you to you, injury. not you to someone else. And yet, while I'm taking the baseline, I'm aware that it's not going well. The impact test is not diagnostic of a concussion. It's a computerized test that analyzes various cognitive functions like verbal memory, visual memory, processing speed, reaction time. So as he said, ideally someone that's engaging in an activity where you're at risk of a head injury will do this when they're well to get their baseline so that then if a head injury occurs, you redo it again and you can see the difference. My short term memory is almost non-existent. We've got different types of memory. So we have working memory, short-term memory, and then long-term memory. So working memory, which is retaining information for a period of seconds. It requires good executive function to be able to pay attention to something, to then incorporate the visual information that comes from it and the auditory information that comes from it. So for example, if there's a bang that happens, we need our executive function to draw our attention to where the bang is. And then we need to be able to process what we see in terms of the cause of the bang. And the fact that we interpret bang is probably not a good thing before we then and interpret what should we do in response to that all that happens in the space of about between half a second and two seconds we then have short-term memory and long-term memory and where short-term memory ends and long-term memory begins technically it's a bit arbitrary but we know that the hippocampus is kind of the first stop for our short-term memory this then funnels information through to our long-term memory which is usually stored in various places in the cortex they come back and they they ask you to recall words that you've used and I didn't know any of them. Mm. So I know enough about these tests. And recall and recognition are different. And it resonates with me that I have done far worse Recall's damage much harder. in my head than I even realized. So in You the, didn't know until that moment? No. I mean... So let's talk about the difference between recall and recognition. So if I ask you to remember three words, classically, when we do these memory tests, we ask people to remember apple, table, penny. I'll first ask you to repeat those words straight after I've told you them to make sure that you've actually registered and processed that information in the first place. The last thing you want is to say someone has cognitive impairment or because they haven't got their hearing aids in and they didn't actually hear what you said in the first place. Then what I need to do is to stop you from rehearsing this information back and forth. Okay, apple, table, penny, apple, table, penny, apple, table, penny. No, no, no. In this case, for this test, that's cheating. That's testing something completely different. So we'll move on to something else. Something that involves a different part of your brain. And then maybe in five minutes time, we'll come back and I'll say, do you remember those three words I asked you to remember before? That's testing recall. If you don't remember those three words, then we try and think about, hmm, how can we exploit recognition here? And we might give multiple choice answers and see if you recognize the option from the list that we said earlier. So recall's harder, recognition is slightly easier, but these are different components that both contribute to the way that we form memories. With Dr. Cantu, I should let you know that one of the biggest difficulties I had was in multitasking. Right. Mm. Everything felt overwhelming. Everything felt overwhelming. So I, you know, I was always the guy paying my bills every month on time, and now I'm the guy just sweeping them to the side. Multitasking requires us to divide our attention to multiple things, or at least to be able to switch our attention and our concentration from one thing to another, to another, to another, to another, in quite quick succession. It all comes back to executive function yet again, that pesky prefrontal cortex. I get a call from John Laurinaitis who says, ah, Mick, it's Johnny. There's an issue with your impact test. 
So I did go back to that doctor as well, who also told me I should never wrestle again. Done. And so I'm thinking, that's it. This, it's not a knee, it's not a, you've seen I walk around better than I used to because I had my hip replaced, my knee replaced. There's no brain replacements. Like this is not something I wanted to toy around with. I had been, man, I've been really fearful because I'd seen the deterioration. There are certain organs in our body that are very, very forgiving. Like the liver, very, very forgiving organ. The brain is not as forgiving. I'm gonna look at the camera. This is a heavier show than I it think is. we've done. Yeah. Um, but man, the concu those concussions are no joke. You see, I, I honestly think I'm doing better than I was yeah. when than when uh, Beyond the Mat was. Um, really, mentally? I do. I think if you watch the movie, even when I'm not calling Barry post uh, post cell, I I sense that I was starting to slur my words a little bit. Slurring our words has a fancy medical name called dysarthria. If your brain is struggling to coordinate the muscles of your tongue, of your lips, or of your throat, then we'll slur our words and sound a bit like we do when we're drunk, which also affects our coordination. And it may be that he really is feeling better, and this is because he's had a much more prolonged recovery time, um, so he hasn't, he's not basically living all the time with post-concussion syndrome. You've given yourself a chance to actually try and recover. That was quite a heavy one. Um, but I think a really important one, we haven't talked about traumatic brain injuries very much and concussions are something that people can relate to in lots of different walks of life. And I think it's really important that we highlight these issues, particularly trying to foresee what the consequences of actions now could be in 20, 30 years down the line. Um, and it gave us a chance to look at lots of different aspects of brain function that can be affected by head injuries. So do let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.